Hello everyone and welcome. Today we are going to discuss the dark side of gaming, particularly dark patterns in games. What are they? Why do we need to be aware of, about them? How can we avoid them and maybe what we can do about it? So my name is Swati and I'm a student at University of Washington in the Department of Human Centered Design and Engineering and I'm preparing to be a UX researcher. And I'm learning about games day by day. So I see communities like this one as kind of amoebas. Do you remember amoebas from your science class? The single-celled organism having the pseudolimbs. So the point is, those pseudolimbs go out, grab some food, bring back to the amoeba, and the amoeba grows. And I somehow see communities like that. Each member of the community being a pseudolimb, going out in the world, <laughs> learning something new, and bringing the wisdom back to the community. So thank you for having me a part of this community, a, a community I wanted to be a part of. I wanted to learn from you and maybe share some of my experiences. <sighs> Perfect. So video games started as a, as a niche, but they grew so rapidly. Back in the day, it was like a secret club only few of, of us knew about. But then something amazing happened. Video games became really popular and everybody started playing, about, playing and talking about that. And it started becoming like a community and my 90s, could be, 90s kid would be like able to relate to it. And back in the day, I started playing games like on a daily basis. It was the highlight of my day. I would spend hours exploring the whole game, the adventures in it. On the screen, you can see my mom is still angry at me for, for spending time with the games and not with books. But how do I tell her that the books right now I'm reading are about video games? It's a science. It's a science for sure. And that's why the slide also reads, uh, games are no child's play. So my engagement with games peaked during my childhood, scared me away throughout my teenage, and the fear monster was so big that today when I look back, I want to tame it. I want to pet it so that it doesn't do to other kids what it did to me. So let me just set the ground first and let's start from the beginning and understand the evolution of games. Perfect, yeah. So games have come a long way since I first started playing. There used to be little discs, if you remember, that you have, you have to buy. And my brother and I used to rush to buy those discs, and we used to convert the TV, our, our television, into a video gaming zone. And I used to save all my pocket money and give it to my brother so that he could go out and buy games for himself that I would play later on. And times were simpler at that at that moment, but they were constantly changing. Later, we got a PC, and now for me, PC meant gaming. What I want to convey from my journey is the gaming industry was evolving. Game development takes a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of pain. And after spending years developing the game, the producers had to mark a fixed price to their games and sell it to arcades or maybe stores. And then after that, it was just a, a number of sales. This way, the game companies weren't making a lot of reoccurring money. And then I saw the emergence of something which required frequent payments. And that was the subscription-based model. But by then, people had switched to even better experiences. World of Warcraft was a big thing. PlayStation was booming. The introduction of subscription-based model changed the gaming industry. It provided a new way for the developers to monetize their games and for the players to access a wider range of content. With subscription-based model, players no longer had to purchase individual games or play for, pay for expensive gaming consoles. Instead, they could just subscribe uh, to a service <coughs> that offered a vast library of games for a monthly fee. Every company saw this success and wanted to try out this model, which meant that the market was getting crowded. The market was getting crowded, but the player's attention was still limited. And maybe this, the company started realizing. And at, the, at a similar time, came something which was known as free-to-play model. 
The impact of this shift in the gaming industry was profound. It made gaming more accessible and fostered a sense of community and collaboration among players. Online multiplayer games became popular, allowing children from different parts of the world to connect and play together. Now understand, these free-to-play games are marketed as a service that runs in the industry for, say, a number of years. And in those number of years, the company tries to make as much profit as possible. For example, um, and, and they try to make this money when they are having this free-to-play model through in-game in purchases. For example, if you see on this screen, I'm not sure how many of you have played Club Penguin, but for me, <laughs> nice. But for me, it was my world. It was my community. I used to play around. I used to like explore the world, a whole virtual world, complete tasks, chatting with friends. I, I used to spend my whole day over there. But in Club Penguin 2, there was something which was known as in-game purchases, and they were like purchasing hats, purchasing uh, accessories, new skins, or maybe puffles. And puffles were, if you remember, those little pets you used to have. Oh my god, <laughs> that was a nice time. And sadly, very sadly, that was the era I started disconnecting from games. And that was because games for me were becoming too demanding. I, I had a peer pressure of buying new accessories for myself, for my pet, and whatnot. In fact, there was some kind of bullying too. And above all, there were unintended payments from my dad's account, which till date, no one in my family believes were unintended. <laughs> <laughs> now that I look back, maybe at that time, as a child, I was a victim of dark patterns, uh, misleading content, or maybe deceptive designs. Things happened that were unintended to and not easy to turn around. And it created kind of a mistrust and it made me fearful about the games. Honestly, till day, I see that kind of fear propagating in the industry and propagating in the world about games. And as a UX researcher, that is the last feeling I want my users to have. So were the free-to-play games encouraging the dark patterns? Let me explain a little bit further. So when games turned free to play, their financial model was dependent, of number of, uh, were dependent on the number of players, the advertisement they were getting, the sponsorship, the partnership they were getting. But it was also dependent on the premium memberships, like where on subscribing you gain uh, advantage, like access to extra areas, newer area areas, enhanced customization, or maybe faster progression. Microtransactions, like buying in-game currency, energy, or maybe stamina refills. And in-game purchases, like character skins, outfit, or accessories. So the problem is, at the end of the day, people do not want to pay money. And when, as a game developer, you see, at the end of the day, there are only a fewer number of people who have bought your in-game items. But how do you try to increase those purchases to earn more money? One option is by nudging the user, by encouraging them to try out those things at their own will. But what happens when you try to manipulate the users, when you try to force them, or maybe deceive them through your designs to make those purchases? This results in something known as dark patterns or maybe deceiving designs. Now that I have sprinkled the word dark pattern here and there, it's time to shine some light on it. Uh, okay. Dark patterns is a term coined by Harry Brignell and it's, it's defined as designs that are inter intentionally deceiving for the user for the benefit of the company at the expense of the user. The slide reads, and any element of manipulative interface designed to trick the users into taking actions they might not have done freely. Now these might be different words, but they convey the same message. And we all know some example of dark patterns if we even don't know what the dark pattern term means. An example is, you are the 100th visitor of the website. Congratulations, lucky you, click here. And God knows what happens when you click there. 
you would be getting spam mails or you might be even uh, like sending in your data and that data might be breached. It could be anything. You, you can't even imagine that. Or maybe when you try to unsubscribe or delete your account from somewhere, the website would take you on each of the page of the website except for the delete or the unsubscribe page. And isn't this what the companies do? They make the text so smaller that you can't even read that. And in fact, I have seen examples where companies have changed the text into white on a white background so that you can't even read that. Or maybe 10 different type of advertisements would pop on when I'm trying to click on something. Or maybe in the real world, tell me that the price of something is $50, and when you're trying to charge me or bill me, you are, you are saying that no, it's 55 because of the additional taxes, your additional charges, and the service fee. So now that you have a basic overview of the dark patterns, I would like to digress a bit, and maybe at this point of time, I would like to appreciate the conference for doing something good, for doing and maintaining some kind of transparency. Look at their buy ticket page. When attendees are coming from all over the place, and they have explicitly mentioned that which all tickets are available, what are the prices, and what would be the extra charge. I'm not sure if you are able to see that on the screen, but this, in the gray, there's uh, additional charges which are mentioned, which, are, which you can also see on the checkout page. The summit is doing a great job over here by not asking me, uh, not hiding any of the cost from me, and not even charging any extra single penny above that. But this practice is not followed throughout the industry. Think of the airline industry. Airlines won't reveal the extra charges you need to pay unless you are deep into the process of booking your airline, booking your flights. And once you are in the middle of it or maybe reaching the end point, they would reveal that, OK, these are the extra charges, and now your cost is maybe $300 more. And what happens at that point of time is people are already tired of making the whole purchase, and they just give up. They don't have the energy to go back and start over again and again. And they just make the purchase. You see, the point I am also trying to make here is it isn't that, the, that just the gaming industry is suffering from dark patterns. It is kind of all industries and maybe in real life too. Again, story time, and I recall an experience where we did a usability testing on a Figma prototype. As it was a prototype, not all buttons and links were working. They were not functional. Um, and when I had a participant and I did a follow-up chat with, about their experience, the participant casually mentioned their frustration about the prototype was filled with dark patterns. And their reason was they couldn't go to places they intended to go. Well, as a UX researcher on the team, rest assured that no dark patterns were employed. It was just a bad user experience. Bad user experience does not necessarily mean the presence of dark patterns. UX problem can occur due to oversight, lack of user research, limited resources, or insufficient testing. These issues can result in frustrating experiences, but they might not be necessarily in involving manipulative or deceptive designs. So here are all the people saying that it's so dark, it's frustrating, and I'm saying that no, it's just a bad user experience. Okay, gear up, we can go back into dark patterns, and let's discuss the type of dark patterns. Firstly, let's discuss temporal dark patterns. And you might have come across these patterns during your gaming experiences. These, these are designed to influence and manipulate the amount of time the users are spending in playing the games, often causing them to play some more. Playing by appointment. It is when that the games require users to play according to a predetermined schedule set by the game, rather than allowing them to have their own flexibility. Think about it. Certain games have limited time sales or maybe limited time quest, which go on for specific hours or maybe specific number of days. And if the users fail to participate in that designated uh, window, they risk missing on getting the rewards. Second, uh, daily rewards. 
Games often provide special rewards and bonuses to players who log in daily. These rewards create a habit of logging every day, and players do not want to miss out on the valuable rewards they are getting. A daily routine makes it difficult from, uh, from, from the games to break away from the games. The dark pattern comes when the user loses all their progress in the game just because they missed just one day and they have to start again from scratch, scratch in the progress game. If you see, Snapchat streaks work in a similar way. The streak gets started when you send your friend a snap and then you need to continue it for like however long you want to do it. And the streak breaks even if you miss just one day. And no friend wants to <laughs> take the blame of breaking the streak because somehow it me means that you're breaking the friendship and you have to come back to Snapchat. So just you're sending a snap of maybe a black screen just to maintain those streaks, even if you don't want to. Perfect. So let's move to the next type of dark patterns. And these are the monetary dark patterns. And let me tell you, money is important. When the item is scarce, you value it more. For instance, Fortnite regularly introduce, introduces limited time game models, such as special events or maybe collaboration with popular franchises like maybe Marvel or Star Wars. By creating a sense of scarcity, Games entice the users to engage with, in, engage with the game and potentially make some in-game purchases. It is considered a dark pattern because it induces a feeling of fear of missing out, basically the FOMO, and it rushes the player into buying, some, buying something which they might not have bought. Secondly, pay to skip. In this dark pattern, users spend money on skipping part of the game they do not want to do or maybe doesn't have the patience to do. For instance, on the screen you can see a user cannot proceed in the game until the, the, the timer is completed, which is showing around 15 minutes, 9 seconds. And you need to wait for those hours, minutes, or days until that energy or the lives is re restored. Until you pay to refill or add those extra lives. The dark pattern arises when the waiting time gets longer and longer as the game progresses upon which the user has to resort to pay just to skip the game, sk skip this uh, waiting time. Coming to the next dark pattern, social dark patterns. Games are meant to be enjoyed with friends and family and game developers might exploit this to gain more extra players. The players play, play primarily because they do not want to let down their friends. Think of social pyramid schemes. Typically, a pyramid scheme works on making money by relying on users bringing more users. One refers to two, two refers to four, four refers to eight, and so on. The game offers the users reward and bonuses for bringing in new players and hence encouraging them to do so. Some games unlock certain features only when a user sends out invites to their, to their social media friend list. It makes other people to be socially obligated to play even if they don't want to wish to. This brings us to the next one, so social obligation. Suppose, suppose your friend invites you to play a game or form a team with them. It creates an obligation for you that if you don't join the game, they are going to lose. And here also you can see an image from Farmville. Do you remember that game? I mean, kind of everyone played Farmville. So in Farmville, people played just because other people were playing it. And the game was totally based on obligation, playing by appointment, routine and responsibility. Even though it was a very basic game, people kept coming back to it. Next and the last type of dark patterns I want to discuss is the psychological dark patterns. Uh, based on a so social understanding of, uh, based on a solid understanding of human psychology, these patterns keep, keep making users come back to the game again and again. Endowed value, uh, when 
we tend to attach a higher value to things uh, which we have created, which we have invested, and we can maybe invest money in it or maybe time in it. Or maybe we are just customizing them, or we have invested in a longer progression in that game. And endowed progress is that that is based on loss aversion bias. A user would, would have the fear of losing all their achievements. And apps like Duolingo use a sad crying owl, which, <laughs> which makes you even further guilty about abandoning your progress. I don't know about you, but that cry, crying owly like, makes me so unhappy. The thought of making it unhappy makes me sad. And psychological dark patterns do not stop till here. Language, language is a big part of it too. I remember a specifically road rage game in which if I lost, they would show me angry and disappointed faces and they would be using words like loser, bummer. And honestly, it affected me a lot. It affected my mood a lot. Perfect. So let's shift some gears here. But as UX researchers, designers, developers, managers sitting here, why do we care? Why does it matter to us? The company wants profit, and the dark patterns are making it happen. So what is the problem here? The problem here is that the user is not kept in the perspective. Let's take a step back and see what UX is and why is it important. So user experience is a relationship between the product and the user using it giving a very basic, simple de definition. And user experience can make or break the success of your product, because it dictates how the user are feeling while they are using your product. When a user com comes to you, you are providing an experience to them, and the user can primarily leave with two kind of feelings. Either it is a satisfaction, or either it is frustration. And good companies try to leave the users with even happier by giving them like extra rewards. For example, if you're you like ordering food for yourself, you would be happy if you can just simply get the food you want. But the, but the company, they would give you extra offers, or maybe they, they would give you a free delivery. And that would somehow make your day. A good user experience increases the engagement of the user with your product, which means that there's a higher chance that you would be able to convert your user into a customer. It also means that once they are on the platform, they won't end up frustrated and would probably come back again repeatedly. Lastly, it can increase the retention of your product. Your user would not run to your competitor. And that is a very big thing in a competitive industry and a competitive industry like gaming. While all of this might sound like a plan, it can be difficult to implement. The use of dark patterns might seem beneficial in the shorter run, but it can erode the trust between the company and its users in the longer run. And it is always about the trade-offs. When people feel tricked or deceived, they are less likely to trust the company in the future. Building trust is important for the longer success. Use of dark patterns might lead to negative reviews, decreased customer loyalty, and a damaged rep reputation for the company. And even if you don't think about the pro uh, in terms of the product itself, dark patterns can have a detrimental effect on the users too. The Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development also recognizes and highlights the harmful effect of dark patterns. Firstly, dark patterns can affect users' autonomy. This slightly steer you towards doing actions which you might not have done otherwise, restricting your ability to make independent and informed choices. It brings personal harm too. You could suffer for financial losses like I did. And it can happen due to deceptive pricing, maybe some hidden cost, or maybe some subscription models that were too, too difficult to understand. Moreover, they might also exploit your privacy by not revealing that how your data is being used, or maybe confusing you about how they are using your data. 
and it can also take a toll on your psychological well-being and time. Excessive screen time, stress, and wasted hours on digital platform have become unintended consequences. Also, on a very broader scale, dark patterns can contribute to structural structure detriment too. Okay, so the last word over there is structural detriment. By weakening or suppressing competition, they create a lesser competitive market, limiting your choice as a user. Trust in digital platform is eroded when the users feel deceived, impacting innovation and engagement. Perfect. So now, let's take a pause over here. And now we have discussed different types of dark patterns. We have also uh, discussed what can be the negative effect of dark patterns. <laughs> But in some cases, we might feel that, OK, we are aware of it. If something like that is happening, we might not fall for it, because we are, we are big enough. We are adult enough. What I'm trying to say here is, suppose in a game I am playing, my friend has a bright pin, pink scre uh, skin, a bright pink accessories. And I am still playing with a black ordinary one, which is by default I'm getting from the game. I won't be crying a lot about that thing because it's not affecting my game and I'm happy with it. But going back to when I was 9 or maybe 13, my game was my world and I wanted to conquer it in the best way possible. In a game, a child, if you think from the perspective of a child, a, a child is a hero. Trying to save the entire world from monsters and evils. And if you show them limited time new weapons that can kill the whole evil monster in just one stab, they want to buy it. I would have want to buy it. The first and the foremost thing for a child in a game is to be the best in the game. The point here is that children do not think and act like grown-up humans. They react and give, on, give in impulses, comparisons, FOMO, and whatnot. And let's try to think about dark patterns from a child's perspective, how dark patterns may look to them. Perfect. So think about a child. Uh, firstly, let's discuss autoplay. And uh, autoplay honestly affects both children and adults. Think about how many Netflix episodes you have seen at 2 AM just because autoplay was on. Children, in particular, are drawn to continuous stream of content, level after level in a game, level after level. And autoplay somehow keeps them engaged, and it makes, them, makes it very hard to leave the game. Positive reinforcement. By showering them with likes, hearts, stars, rewards, and, and everything else just for even simpler achievements. Developers are creating an environment where children are constantly seeking validation. Children feel accomplished when they receive these rewards, leading them to spend more time in the game and becoming more engrossed in the game. Badges and rewards. OK, so I remember when I was in seventh grade, I was a prefect of the class, the monitor of the class. And I didn't even miss one class of that grade because I had a responsibility. I have had the responsibility of being the best student of the class. And similar thing happens in the game too. When you are giving the child such kind of big sense of achievement, they might not fully understand that it is designed to keep them coming back to the game. Nudges, techniques, and maybe push notifications. Games use nudging techniques to encourage children to spend more time on the digital platform. For example, uh, rewards for daily play, using enticing features for creating a sense of urgency or FOMO. These tactics can have a financial implication on the children as well as on their families. And lastly, product placement. The word over there is placement. Imagine a child playing their favorite game on a popular gaming platform and they are immersed in the virtual world, navigating through the challenges and the quest. Suddenly, their favorite character pro, uh, their favorite uh, character displays in the game, and it is a real world brand of maybe soda or maybe clothing or maybe a snack. 
and it is somehow involved in the storyline. As a child, they would also like to have the same. And this is an example of product placement. Children might not realize that this is done and this is being influenced by the marketing tactics. Let's come to this slide and think of this slide as a disclaimer slide. A disclaimer that when I say the phrase dark design, both the words dark and design are subjective. And ultimately the intention of the company and the effect the users have speaks out the loudest. What may be perceived as a dark design by one person can be perceived as a clever UX strategy by another. And in the world of design, there's a delicate ba uh, balance between creating en engaging experiences and manipulating users' behavior. And it is more complex in the world of gaming because there's a, the target audience is not just fun. There's a whole age range of target audience. Understand this. It is not that the designers enter a meeting room with the sole intention that when they're out of this room, they would be creating dark patterns. But most of the times, the design choices they make, that might be exceptional in the industry, but it could not be well received by the, uh, by the players, and that might create a backlash. For example, think of this, visualize this. You are playing a game, and the color for the CTA button to start the game is green. It's green in color. You press it. The CTA button to go to the next level of the game is again green. You press it to go to the next level. The CTA button to go to another level, level after level, is again green in color. You are, you are kind of conditioned to, play, uh, to press the green button level after level. After certain levels, there appears another green CTA button which says, buy lives. As a player, deeply engrossed in the games, completing one level after the other, it is easy enough to click the green button because you are conditioned for it. And if my credit card details are stored over there, it is just a matter of one more click that my money is deducted and the purchase would be unintended. This is where the line between good UX and dark patterns becomes blurry. The intention behind using the same color for different buttons might have been just to create some consistency in the game and familiarity for the user. However, when it comes to the buy lives button, it can easily deceive and manipulate the users into making a purchase without fully understanding the consequences. Uh, on the screen, you can see three different examples of a pop-up that asks you twice before deleting your progress in the game. And let me move to the next slide because you can see the examples better over there. Perfect. Uh, in these examples picked from different games, you need to write specific phrases in the space provided in case you want to delete your progress in the game and you just want to abandon it. Take a good look at it. And in the top left, uh, top left example, it says, do you want to delete level 80 warrior? And type delete in the field to confirm. And you need to write the word dele delete and, there's, and then there's an OK and a cancel button. Think about it and keep this in your mind and I'm going to progress, but I'll be coming back to this. On this screen, you see something different. You can see a horizontal gradient starting from white at the leftmost and ending at black at the right end. And dark patterns are subjective. What's dark for you might not be dark for me. Think of it this way. The closer your design is to the left boundary, the white one, the better it serves the user. And the darker it is, it serves the company with no consideration for the user. As a company, you want to make the users happy, but you also want to earn some money. So most of the designs fall into something which I call the gray zone, the gray pattern zone. Going back Okay. 
So I'm not able to move the slide. Uh, so think about it. Think about it. So going back to the previous example, when, where I was showing you that you need to write the word delete to delete the game. As, as a user, as a game, uh, as a game industry, as a game developer, you might understand that it takes efforts. It takes effort to get tho that kind of progress in the game. And you're helping me making sure that I really want to delete this because this action could be permanent and I would lo lose all my, all my progress in the game. Hence, by this logic, this would be a dog, this would be a white pattern. And I would place something in the first, uh, under the uh, white pattern uh, block. But on the other side, you can also claim that this design is making, you, making it difficult for you to delete the game by creating extra barriers for you, by forcing you to think about it, whether you want to delete it or not, by adding additional barriers, you are trying to retain the users, and hence it makes it a dark pattern, uh, maybe in the right, right most side. And often designs like this, uh, I'm talking about this design, yeah. So designs like this, where you are asking the user to write the word delete in case you want to delete your progress, they, this starts a conversation. And because it has both positive and the negative sides talking about it, it might fall under the gray pattern area. Either you can keep user's point right now here, that it is creating barriers for you, or maybe you can defend your company's logic, company's intention that it is a permanent action and it cannot be restored. And in both cases, kind of you would be right. But it is on you and your company to decide that which way you want to go. Okay, so till now, you might seem that it's not in your hand and it's getting all out of control. So let's take a deep breath and also take some notes on how as a user, you can prevent dark patterns. Firstly, learn about dark patterns. Educate yourself about the sneaky tactics used in games and apps to manipulate you. Knowing how they work would help you spot them at the, f at, at, at the earliest. And Resist them. Check reviews and ratings. Before downloading a game or an app, read what others are saying, specifically if you are a parent. Look out for warnings about manipulative practices and excessive tricks. Third, or maybe next, uh, adjust your privacy settings. Take charge of your privacy and review and limit the permission the app is asking for. Turn off unnecessary notifications to avoid getting load back to play the game again. Be mindful of your purchases. Think before making an in-app, in-game purchase, and watch out for the tactics that are pushing you to, into impulsive buying. Use parental controls. If you are a parent, use parental controls to manage the features of your, of your child's game, to manage their screen time, and maybe block inappropri inappropriate content. Discuss about it, talk to your child, have conversations about responsible digital behavior, and teach them how to think critically about game tricks and purchases. And also, when you're discussing it, report deceptive practices. If you come across apps or games that are using manipulative tactics, report them to the app store or the platform itself. In fact, there are platforms like darkpattern.org where, where they have a nice wall of shame and you can go and no, they, they actually have a wall of shame. And you can go there and post about it. And in fact, Twitter. Twitter is also very much active about dark patterns. Your actions can help raise awareness and maybe protect others. It's a long slide. <laughs> Perfect. So now, as a user, you understand what you might do. But as UX practitioners sitting here, who would be going back to the work after this summit? What can you start doing? Or what can you maybe continue doing so that you support your users and not trick them with deceptive designs? The very simple answer is to have a UX mindset. Start with research and testing with your real users. I am not the user. You are not the users. As designers, 
as designers and developers of the game, you might not be the user of the real game. So go out in the world and do your research. Test your products and understand your audience. Read the reviews and the feedback. Many a times, games not meant for children are used by children. And in such a case, your audience changes. Iterate your designs either to accommodate them or not accommodate them at all. Secondly, uh, design principles. Advocating for users would always be a difficult con uh, conversation and it would have conflicting ideas. In such a case, follow design principles. There's a high chance that your team might not have design principles ready, in which case I would recommend you to check how other companies are doing it. And in most of the cases, those companies would have listed users as their first priority. Having design principles in general also like helps you stay focused on the track. A very basic example is honestly this happened to me yesterday. My teammates, uh, teammates, teammate asked me to change the content of my designs and to make all the donate buttons into donate today. And her opinion was that the donate today was more actionable. And my only logic and my only reasoning to them was that as per the design principles we set up earlier, our, our first principle was that we want to keep our designs simple for the users and maybe not actionable and that was not on the list. And because they have agreed to the design principles in the past, they had to agree that it would be a better choice to keep donate button as just donate and not using donate today. And this might happen with you too. Just because you have design principles ready, you can state them and the conversation most of the times stops over there. Ethical design. Prioritize ethical consideration in your design process, ensuring that your design serves the best interest of users. Very basic example, if your, games, if your game collects user data, ensure that you are providing clear, clear instructions on how to access the privacy settings. Avoid hidden cost or deceptive pricing strategy that can mislead users and erode the trust. Uh, collaboration and advocacy. Collaborate with your team members and stakeholders to advocate for user-centered design. Discuss in gr groups and communities like this one. And the mere fact that you are attending this talk is your first, to, uh, first steps towards ethical, user-friendly, and clean design. So congratulations. Perfect, so I acknowledge that the games are difficult to make and when they are out in the market, games need to make money. Having a win-win situation is important and that's what UX practitioners do the best. They find the most optimal solution to problem and they try to improve people's life with technology. Let us remember that our users are not just statistics or data points. They are individual with unique needs, preferences and challenges. It is our duty that our designs are designed with empathy and integrity, considering the long-term impact of our choices on our users' lives. Games are designed to be fun and playful activities for everyone, but the emergence of dark patterns and such toxic behavior is causing harm to both the game industry and it's, it's making the spaces not, spaces not inclusive and welcoming. One negative behavior might lead to a long-lasting ne negative effect on the players. And lastly, as I speak today, I do not claim the ownership on the original research work and the progress made in the field. And I would request you to reach out to me in case you want extra references or maybe further resources. And there's a link over there. So in your break time, if you still want to get a sense of how the dark patterns would make you feel, go over to that link and try that out. That's a very nice, cool project and I would recommend that. Perfect, so that was my time and I would be happy to take your questions.
Uh, so the question you are asking that in live games, certain things like uh, the time thing, that buying buying certain thing in a certain time is kind of normal to to be expected, and how is it a dark pattern? Is that the question? Not even necessarily buying, but like as we would make with the game in a particular time frame or something. I know you can talk about the temporal Yeah. So my answer to that would be, games are meant to be make to be engaging, and that is the normal thing. But sometimes you need to understand that who your users are. It's okay if they are if they are like adults enough, but think about it. If if it it's a child and you're making them go through all this formal kind of a feeling, what can negative effect they might have on their lives? In that case, you need to go back to your users, do your research, and understand that what kind of negative effect it, it is having on the users. Now, having having the game becoming engaging and having these kind of tactics is not necessarily bad, but what happens is it might have a bad effect on the users, and that's where you need to come ahead and think about it. So yeah, it could, it could, it could maybe not harming the user, but you have to make sure that it is not harming the user. Mm -hmm. I have one from the chat. Mm -hmm. um, so this first person, oh, no, so this first person has several questions actually. So the first one is, are there any coalitions or movements to reduce deceptive patterns in games? How do we differentiate between motivating players and deceptive patterns? And is there a checklist or tool out there that we can use to check designs for deceptive patterns? Okay, so the first question is that are there any groups talking about dark patterns? So yes. Like I also mentioned in the in the slide itself, deceptive patterns or darkpattern.org is talking a lot about it, and there are other websites too. Twitter is very active, and they have a hashtag called asshole designs. So if you search that, you would find a lot of content over there. Dark patterns is still something which people have started talking about, and it is still that people have started discussing, and we do not have. Uh, Groundbreaking rules in that in that sense. So right now, talking about it is the ba is the main thing, and you can go ahead and use social media and your power to talk about the things you find that that might be harming your users. The second question was, how do we differentiate between motivating players and deceptive patterns? This is the major question, and this is something which we need to understand. Oh yeah yeah, sorry, I'll repeat the question. Yes. So what's the difference between a motivating design and a dark pattern? Basic answer is the intention. Your intention could be that you just want to motivate the user so that they are engrossed in the games. For example, let me say about uh, Duolingo. It motivates you every day so that you can come back and learn. Here the intention is to teach you. Here the intention is to continue your learning. But what if you're motivating in such a way that you're sending them a push notification that come back to the game, come back, back to the game, and your user users are maybe small kids. It would have a negative effect on them because now they're spending more time in the game and it might not be uh, necessarily healthy for them. So again, go back to your users, do the research and understand that maybe you are trying to motivate them, but what kind of effect it is having on the users itself. Does that make make sense? <laughs> There's no one to reply. And the third question from that same block, is there a checklist or tool out there that we can use to check designs for dark patterns? There, okay, so dark pattern in itself is not a very defined thing. Like I mentioned, something which is a dark pattern for you might not be a might not be a dark pattern for someone. It would be just a simple design tactic. It would be just a simple design strategy. So there is, at least for my knowledge, there is no such kind of a checklist, but I would say talking about it and getting a general sense of awareness would be helpful so that you know that what could be the cases and what could be the examples of it, and maybe you could avoid that in your, in your designs. Anything else? There's more, but I don't want to give everyone else a chance to ask questions if they have anything else. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead.
Okay. So the question is that are there any metrics which by, by itself are causing dark patterns to happen? And I would say that as a company, as, as a team, you need to make sure that what kind of metrics are you using? Even if you are using some kind of metrics, how useful are they to you and your team? And what kind of effect, again, it is having on the user? You need to go back and understand that are these, are these metrics even helpful for you? And in that case, some kind of like maybe design principles would help you. Suppose you are, you are having, uh, okay, I'll give you an example. So sometimes there's a metric, let's assume that you need to increase the subscribers on your newsletter, maybe you say. What you can do is you can make it either opt-in or maybe opt-out. And you know that opt-out is going to increase the number of users for you because, because checking the box is a, a, another additional step for you and people might not do. This would increase your metric, but is it even helpful for you? Is it even like worth it? So again, go back to the design principles, discuss it with your team that what kind of metrics are actually important for us and what are like not important for us. And yes, it could be a case that some of the metrics are increasing the dark patterns so for which you need to do the research and you need to advocate for the users itself. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, yeah. So the so the question is the follow up question is okay. I'm losing all the try all the all the thought thoughts in my head. So the question is that you as as a company you might want some kind of monetary um, how to say you want money out of the users in some sense. And could there be better metrics to have those? Having money out of the user is important because as game developers, you are you are actually spending a lot of investment in your games. Game, making games is not an easy thing. And there has been um, cases where the, where the design studios and the game studios could not sustain because they didn't make enough money. Making games in the money is important. And most of the games do make it. But how you are making it kind of is the question over here. And you know what, also talking about dark patterns in games is very tricky because games aren't static. They are always moving. The, the graphics are always moving. If, if on a static page you are having a click here to pay now or click here to make the purchase, it's very easy to say that it's on a dark side or a light, lighter side or, or maybe it's a clean design. But in games, it becomes very tricky because there are so many moving items. There are mo so many moving things. So coming back to your question again, you have to be the advocate of how you're doing it. You have to be the advocate of the users. It could be a thing that people want to try out and people are buying your things. But it could be also a case that people are leaving ne negative feedback that I didn't want to leave, I didn't want to make a purchase and it happened that it was unintended. You're getting customer calls that return my money. This is not even what I expected to do. And as a UX researcher, you need to sit down and understand with different teams that what is happening in your game. Does this answer? I would not be able to comment on the metrics because I, right now I feel that I'm not able to do that based on my experience, but that would be my answer. Thank you. Yeah, please go ahead. Mm, I would require some more information about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'll just do the next question then. Um, have you found any specific dark patterns in games tied to specific cultural behaviors um, or individual values? Let me think about that. 
So the question is, have you seen dark patterns based on cultural behaviors? And what was the second thing? Or um, individual values one person may care about. Or individual values a person may care about. So I'm, I, what, what my thought is going is in the terms of farm wealth, which I gave you an example of. When I was playing farm wealth, it didn't matter to me that which friend, uh, if friend was sending me farm wealth because when I went to play farm wealth, it was asking me for so much information that I didn't even want to fill that out. Because at that time, I was, I was concerned about my, uh, my data, that what kind of data I'm giving out to them. Because what farm wealth was doing it, it was posting on everyone's timeline that they, these people are playing this game. And maybe I didn't want to play, uh, want to like be a part of it. But most of my friends came back to me and accused me for not being a good friend just because I was not being a part of that culture. And that thing happens a lot when you are having social obligation. That thing happens a lot when your friends are dependent on you to come into the game and play with them and not, not playing them, not playing with them somehow you get the blame that because of you, you are losing, losing the game. So maybe if I talk about individual perspective, this was somehow my experience. For cultural, um, for understanding the cultural perspective, I would be requiring some more in-depth research so that to answer that question. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is that, in, suppose in the gay, in the example of snap uh, snap streaks, people are engaged in it, and how much responsibility of that falls on the parents, and how much of that is falling on the developers and the designers? And I think about it in that way, that. When your game is small, when your impact is not that much, and you are trying to get the users into the game, the effect you see on people might not that be large. But when I see about now Snap, Snapchat, I see every other person, especially youngsters, playing it, and it is having some kind of impact on it. And when the company becomes so big, it certainly has some kind of a social responsibility. So as a company, they need to decide that what kind of, what kind of uh, restrictions now they need to put and what kind of effects they are having on the, on the, on the players or, or maybe the users because they need to target that which audience they are catering to. And about the parents, I feel that particularly from where I come from, there was kind of no restrictions on how much uh, time the, the child is spending in the games. And I feel that as a parent too, you need to be aware and you need to be educated that what kind of uh, impact social media is having on your child and what kind of impact the games are having on your child. In fact, I don't know like in depth, but yesterday I read a notification and it said that there was a research paper which was explicitly talking about what kind of effect social media is having on children and the, and the results were devastating. So maybe, I'm not, I wouldn't say that this much percentage uh, is on parents and this much percentage is on designers because this is a collaborative and a collective effort that you need to be aware of what kind of effects you are having